About a year ago, I was asked to go to the middle of nowhere to help my uncle film some footage for his wild Alaskan seafood company. Well, my name is Clay Besnick and I live in Ketchikan, Alaska. And we have a very vibrant salmon fishery and a large part of the seafood community is based out of Ketchikan. He fishes wild Alaskan salmon just south of Ketchikan, Alaska, and invited me up for about four days to try to capture the incredible job that he does and then to show the world how wild the seafood really is. In this video, I wanna to try to share what a crazy job this is, but also how I went about trying to document it and then the equipment I brought to use along the way. So the job itself, before I get into the details of how I tried to document this, I want to talk a little bit about what a commercial salmon fisherman actually does, what the job's like, so you can understand what it meant for me to try to go in and capture it. In this case, my uncle and his son, my cousin, they both run their own about 45 foot gill netting boats. And they're working just crazy hours, 18 to 20 hours a day, basically during a three, four month span of the summer when fishing permitting is allowed. And what's really interesting about Alaska is they have incredible sustainability initiatives and incredible seafood management. It's hard for people in the lower 48 to understand, but so much of our time is taken up ensuring that our fish populations remain healthy in Alaska. I'm a member of the Pacific Salmon Commission, where all we do is ensure that fish go up to the rivers to spawn. Seafood's a huge part of the economy, so it's a big business focus for them to ensure that the fish are sustainably managed, but it's also quite cool to see that these fisheries are actually growing in population every year. So everything's off the coast of western Alaska, sort of in the middle of nowhere. I mean, eight, ten hours away from any sort of town or village. It's just them on their boats with perhaps a deckhand, out fishing for 18, 20 hours a day. Currents here are wicked, and because of those currents, salmon get pushed into the beaches where we have our nets. And we're the first nets, first people, that these fish have seen since they've been growing up out on the ocean. It's hard really to describe how wild this place is. Just the waves crashing up against the shore. Sometimes you just forget how much power is in this ocean. Outside of our office, we have orcas, humpback whales, sea lion seals, eagles every single day. We just want to share a little bit of that with you guys down in the lower 48. So what was it actually like to document this? I don't have a lot of experience doing any sort of documentary work. So this was really something new to me and a lot of fun, but I definitely felt like I was in deep water, literally and, and metaphorically. And I think there's a couple lessons that I can share from my experience that might be helpful for you. The first thing is to step into the shoes of the subject that you're trying to capture. Look for that perspective. The second thing, listen for the story, don't try to tell it. And then lastly, always put in the extra effort to control the aesthetics. So stepping into the shoes of what you're trying to capture. I think the biggest thing that helped me with this particular shoot was actually understanding the work that was going on and 
taking some time to understand the complexities and the challenges that they face. Before stepping onto the boat, I had a bit of a preconception of what the job was actually like and, and what the environment was actually like, but it turns out I was completely wrong. I'd heard about it for years and years and years from my uncle and my cousin, but until I was actually out there seeing it, I just didn't get it. So I spent the first day and a half just sitting in and observing what was actually going on. I worked the net a little bit, I helped with some engine maintenance. I, I just spent time trying to understand what the perspective of my uncle and a real fisherman is. And I think that helped me massively in being able to actually relay the story of what I was trying to tell. Because when it came time to turn the camera on, I knew exactly the kind of challenges that I was trying to highlight and the interesting points of the process that I was trying to capture. It's probably simple and you all probably know it, but the thing I have to share is take the time to step into the shoes and understand the perspective of the subject you're trying to capture. I think it'll go a long ways in terms of setting you up for success. So the second thing, listen for the story, don't try to tell it. Now, what I mean by this is I came into this with an expectation of here's what we're gonna produce. I'm gonna capture some of this really cool footage. Uncle, you're gonna you're gonna say these words and then boom, we're gonna sell fish. The reality is is when I got out there, I realized that that wasn't necessarily the story to tell. As I listened and I heard the challenges and observed the scenery and observed the actual process, I, I kind of quickly learned, okay, I was a little bit off in me trying to tell this story. I love this so much that I wanted my kids to have a taste of it, whether they chose to stay into it or not. Being out here for weeks on end, days on end, I wouldn't do this if I was by myself. No, having my dad out here with me fishing is one of the coolest things I can imagine for a career, you know, being able to spend this much time with your dad. The fact that my career and my dad's are intertwined to that degree is, is really special. Yeah. And what came out of it instead was this really intriguing, compelling story about a father and his son who've spent their life fishing wild fish. And this was a little bit different than the preconception I had coming in. So it was super valuable for me to just take a minute to listen. So the big learning for my arrogant self was to listen not tell. Although it did help having a little bit of an idea of what I was going to do, so maybe tell a little bit. <laughs> Lastly, be ready to control the aesthetics. So these guys aren't models. I mean, they're wild fishermen. L let me just show you my error here. The fact that my career and my dad's are intertwined to that degree is do you see really it? special. Yeah the massive Under Armour logo that I let fly into my scene. Does it take you out of it? Cause it sure does to me. And maybe I'm just being nitpicky here, but this was like a two second fix that I could have, I could have had. I could have told him to pull his overalls up, not change anything materially, and it would have been a world better. So the learning here for me is to pay attention to all the little details. You don't have to change everything in a scene. You don't have to completely take people out of what their norm is. And that was one thing I was worried about, right? Telling anybody to change up who they are in this job because I'm trying to capture it. Pay attention and be attentive to the aesthetics. I totally botched it, but you don't have to. So first off, this was a four day trip. So not a ton of time to plan and it was something that was going to be moving very quick. And for that, it meant that I needed gear that was gonna be super flexible and then sort of lightweight. The reason I didn't want to bring a lot is because number one, I just didn't want to schlep a lot. But then I also didn't want gear to get too in my way. I was going to be on a small space. I was going to have to move quickly and just try to capture things as they happened. So I wanted this to be simplified. So the equipment. My thinking was I wanted a flexible hybrid camera. I was going to be doing photos and video. It was mostly for the web, so the photos didn't need to be crazy. And for this, I picked the A7S III. It's what I had available and it works great for this type of environment. It has autofocus, small and easy to pack, 
and just makes sense for the hybrid type of work I was planning to do. On top of that, I packed the Sigma 24-70 f2.8 art lens, another kind of example of a perfect workhorse do-it-all lens. It had a good focal range, it has great autofocus, the visuals are great, it works very well for video, so it was kind of a no-brainer. I rigged the a7S III, by the way, with a small rig half cage and then a top handle, because I knew half of what I would be doing would be handheld. I also put a small HD focus monitor on top of that. And then for audio, I did a Rode Wireless Go 2 and then hooked in the Rode VideoMic NTG for scratch audio. So I was able to actually record out of both tracks at the same time, which was handy for both interviews and then scratch audio of the environment as things were happening. And then of course I slapped on some variable NDs onto the Sigma lens, which meant I basically had everything I need for a full cinema rig. Along with this, I decided to bring a drone because I wanted to capture the scale of the environment just to show how remote this place is. And then of course I brought a tripod and then a five in one reflector so I could do the bare minimum of light management if I needed to. So despite aiming for the minimal, this was still a lot to carry, frankly, but it was enough to be flexible and gave me the ability to capture everything I needed. And then I decided to totally botch it and rented a 100 to 400 millimeter G Master. I brought my A7R4, I brought my 14, 24, 35, 85, 50 millimeter lenses. Uh, so yeah, I just went over the top for no good reason and schlepped anyway. But yeah, I even brought the Ronin S, didn't use it, it was great. I don't have a ton of experience in this type of work, but this was really a compelling way for me to step in, and I'm completely intrigued by it. This was a ton of fun. I hope the things that I learned, though probably simple and not all that insightful, is something that can be helpful for you if you're trying to do anything like this. I hope you liked the video. If you found it useful or entertaining, please let me know, and like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks.